Hi, this is Steve Withers, and we're here in Bracknell, Berkshire, to give you an exclusive look at Genesis Technologies' brand new experience centre. And I'm joined now by a familiar face to the people of Maybe Forums, Neil Davidson. Hi, Steve. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you, Neil. How are you? Not too bad. So perhaps, Neil, you could start by giving us a talk through to the philosophy behind the experience centre. Well, what we wanted to be able to do is set up a facility in the UK that really uh, exemplifies the reference level home cinema um, and also really high performance audio and video. Um, so really taking it the full, the full way, um, full design, acoustical treatment, the best products that we can put in, proper amplification, to really try and put together an experience that's different from, from anything else that was available in the UK before. Now we're actually sat in the Pro Cinema room right now. Perhaps you could explain exactly how you constructed this, uh, this Pro Cinema. This uh, cinema room um, has been made as a room within a room. Um, it's fully sound isolated. Um, it's actually uh, made with two layers of 15mm plasterboard with green glue onto an 80mm metal stud, the 50mm air gap, all filled with rock wool, and then repeated again. So it's a double stud construction. Um, it took 12 tonnes of plasterboard um, to build this room. Um, so no sound leaks out of it. I uh, testify that I can't hear a sound <laughs> outside. So it, it's, it's worked very well. Um, it's important to point out this is, is a, an office, a working office for other companies as well. So it was important that we did that. We, uh, we really had nowhere to hide if we failed in our sound isolation. So I think we've done an okay job here. Yeah, so as I said, I can definitely testify to the quality of the soundproofing. Now, uh, what sort of audio have you got in this room? Then? Um, in this room, we have a, a, a mid-level uh, pro audio technology. It's a, an American company. Um, we are using their SCR12. Um, front speakers, so it's a 12 inch woofer um, and a 1 and 3 quarter inch compression horn uh, tweeter, um, so very, very high efficiency mm -hmm. and high power handling. Um, for the surrounds, we're using the SCRS 26, that's just an in wall surround speaker, so it's, it's very small, people are never <laughs> impressed when they see it. Um, we have to let them hear it to, to let them understand what it's all about. Um, what Pro Audio Technology do that's different to other companies? is that they use true commercial drivers. The, the drivers that are in these speakers are designed for PA systems and concerts. Um, even though they get driven hard in these theatres, th th they're not even coming close to their working capacity. And that's why they can play so loud and so cleanly. Um, the other big thing that we have on the audio system is the amplifiers themselves. They're all active, the speakers mm -hmm. that we have in here. Um, now, the amplifiers themselves also contain DSP, um, and the speakers themselves in the factory, um, in the factory they are measured in a half space, so really they're installed in a wall and measured half space, and they come from the factory half space, plus and minus a third of a decibel from the roll-off at the bottom end to 20 kilohertz. Um, that, that's fairly unique in the speaker world, testament to the power of the DSP, yeah. um, but we've really been able to measure that performance in this room as well. Obviously there are some changes, um, but you can really see how flat the, the speaker response is in this room. So we're very happy with the performance. And um, what about subwoofers? We've got four subwoofers in here. Um, we have two at the front of the room, um, two 15 inch subwoofers that supply the, the main impact. They're ported subwoofers, so they've got a little bit more depth to them. Um, we also have two 15 inch sealed subwoofers at the back of the room um, and what they help to do is, is just combat some of the standing wave issues that you always have yeah. in a small room. Um, they don't give quite the same slam as the ported subwoofers that we have at the front but they give that very nice fill. We have a very, very consistent base in this room. Yeah, I can speak from experience, having experienced it myself earlier on. Um, and what about acoustic treatment within the room? Yeah, again, the room, uh, because we wanted to, to show something that's not so common over here, the room has been fully acoustically treated. Um, that acoustical treatment's from an American company called Cinematech. Um, now, what's fairly unique is every single square inch of the wall in this room has acoustical treatment on it. Um, the reason for that is the acoustical treatment is actually relatively shallow. Um, it's designed to be an inch and a half, so what's that, 35 millimetres? Mm -hmm. Um, deep, which is very, very shallow for acoustical treatment. Um, the reason it can get performance in the low frequencies and mid frequencies, though, is because it covers the whole wall. 
um, and it's really been designed um, to, to act as a diaphragm. Um, it, it flexes and that gives the absorption that we need. Um, we also have a little bit of diffusion. Um, anyone who's seen a, a diffusion panel knows that it's <laughs> a, a fairly ugly thing to look at. Yeah. So what we've done is we've hidden the whole lot behind stretched acoustical fabric. Um, one of the biggest challenges and biggest unique things in this room in fact is that we have curved intersections of acoustical stretched fabric which uh, you don't see too often I can tell mm. you and uh, the company who, who uh, sell this system were very very impressed that we were able to achieve this without their assistance. <laughs> um, okay moving on to the video side of things what's producing the images in this room? Um, in this room we have uh, really a, a flagship projector from a British company called Digital Projection um, their factory is in Manchester, of all places. Um, now, that projector is a, a Titan 1080p 3D projector. It produces 4,500 lumens um, and still has a very high contrast ratio. Now, what that enables us to do is fill a large screen like we have here, yeah. but also for 3D, of course, we have an awful lot of power to give a, a, a bright and also colour accurate 3D image. Um, the, the projector that we have in here really is a, a commercial level product. That's what yeah. it's designed for. Um, it's not a digital cinema projector, but that's only because it doesn't have the encryption on it. In every other way, it's a, right. a true commercial cinema projector. Using active shutter? or We use active shutter in here, um, and we're using the new Expand X104 glasses, okay. um, which offer the best performance. Um, w one of the really unique things, actually, that we've found is the projector enables us to calibrate very, very accurately to the glasses. Obviously with the 104s we also have some extra calibration features and I think that in this room we're able to achieve a 3D performance that, that probably people have not seen before because it has that combination of minimal flicker, it is an active shutter system, um, but also very, very high brightness relative perhaps to what people have seen yeah, before. Yeah, I think brightness makes a massive difference when it comes to 3D. For, for, for 3D it's like any projection you need enough brightness to keep to keep depth in the image, otherwise, of course, it goes flat, and that's one thing for 3D that you really don't want to have. <laughs> yeah, quite. Does, do the glasses use triple flash? or? Um, we actually do have triple flash. Um, that's, again, one of the unique things that we have with digital projection. Um, they've been offering triple flash on their projectors, um, so triple flash for 24 frame material, yeah. um, for three years now. So we've really been at the forefront of 3D, um, and I think it, it really comes across. You can see that the performance is not what you'd expect from your normal projector. Well, so obviously, Neil, this is this is kind of the, the high-end dream home cinema. Uh, but what can forum members do to achieve something similar in their own environment? Well, one of the most important things, Steve, that we wanted to do in this room is is follow reference standards for home cinema design. There is actually a video elsewhere on AV forums um, where Phil joined us for a CDA home cinema design training. Um, and those standards have been rigorously applied in this room and forum members can use those standards themselves to, to get the same type of performance because that's what these standards are there for. It just scales with the size of the room that you have. So people can achieve really, really high performance by using those standards. So Neil, by, f by following these uh, industry standards, um, then forum members could uh, almost replicate what we're experiencing here with their own home cinemas? Yeah, that's one of the, the great things about the standards. Um, obviously there are equipment limitations, but within the bounds of those limitations, things like the, the correct viewing angle for the screen to give you the right screen size, screen position, subwoofer layouts, etc. They all really, really help to improve um, the performance that people can achieve and make it easier, to be honest, for them to achieve the sort of performance that they're after. It's, it's one of the things that you and I both see on the forums that people want to know more about home cinema design and I would really encourage them to try and find out more about those standards because it will really help. One of the things that forum members are wary of are custom installers because of the potential cost involved. Perhaps you could give your opinion on that? Well, um, if people want to achieve a certain standard, they do have to understand that there is also a certain level of cost that goes along with that. But I think people perhaps are, are a little bit too wary. It's easy to think that to do, you know, a nice home cinema could be 20, 30, 50,000 pounds. And of course it could cost that, but there are many good custom installation companies that can help people achieve what they're looking to achieve at their home, you know, for, for, for less money than that, if you have existing equipment and so on. Um, there are a number of those companies who post 
in the custom installation forum at AV forums. And I, I really think that people shouldn't be afraid. If you have a budget, you know what your budget is, and you explain that to the company right up front, there's no reason why that company can't develop and deliver a system to you that meets your expectations. So what, what kind of control system would a complex home cinema like this actually have? Um, in this room, Steve, we're actually using a Control 4 control system. The, the system actually controls our whole experience centre here. Um, it was very important for us to be able to show uh, a really well integrated solution so everything can be done at the touch of a button, basically. Now, I know, of course, that people probably want to achieve that type of thing in the home. Um, and one of the things that you and I have spoken about before is, is the use of iPads um, and so on. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced any of those types of solutions yourself so far? Uh, only briefly, uh, to be honest. But uh, I think one of the problems that people have experienced with control systems in the past has been the cost associated with them. It seems to me that now that the iPad and things like the iPad have come along and, and other smart devices, it's, it's, it's lowered the cost considerably and people can actually create quite a quite quite an effective control system for a fraction of the cost that it used to be. Is that the kind of experience Yeah, I mean, had? to do a really... Uh, high-end dedicated control system used to be an unbelievable cost for people. Now with systems like Control 4, people can get a very, very, very comprehensive professional level system in their home for for the price of a large screen TV, let's face it, um, which is completely different from what they were ever used to before. Um, you also have people who, who like to, to do these things themselves. And with the iPad now, there are a few programs um, that enable people to design which are good, good control interfaces, obviously within the limitations of what the iPad can do itself. So Neil, this, this is the Pro Cinema Room, and you also have an, another um, demo room, which is the Wisdom Room. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about, about the, what's behind that. Sure. Well, what we wanted to do was is give a, a counterpoint, basically, to the cinema that we have here. This is really no compromise cinema. You're not going to have this <laughs> as, your, as your front room. Um, and what we wanted to show is that people could get a similar type of performance, but in a completely different way. So with very discreet speakers that are installed in wall and um, without having to give up a lot of floor space, without full acoustical treatment and all that type of stuff. Um, and that really is what we wanted to do in the Wisdom Audio Room. Um, probably the Wisdom Audio Room also favours music a little bit more than the cinema here does. Although both can do it, it's, it's, it's a more comfortable place to sit and listen to music. Um, looking at the speakers in there, I noticed they're quite an unusual design. Perhaps you could talk me through that. Yeah, they are a very unusual design. Um, Wisdom Audio have been around for about 13 years, and what they have always been famous for is their planar magnetic panel technology. So the speakers don't use a normal tweeter for the high frequencies. It's really a large panel. Um, the, the, the voice coil itself is printed onto the panel, so that means they've got very, very high power handling because the heat can get away from the voice coil almost instantly. Um, but still in a compact design that, that that's very sensitive. It can produce subtle details extremely well. Um, it's a different type of, of speaker design, and yeah, the, the larger ones um, have a, a more dynamic output, but that's the same with every speaker. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed there was quite a large equipment rack full of amplifiers. Perhaps you could just talk me through that. Yes, um, the, the equipment rack is good fun that we have there. Um, one of the things with, with Wisdom Audio speakers is, as I mentioned, they are sensitive, but they also have extremely high power handling if you want to. So for our reference listening room, we wanted to use Wisdom Audio's own amplifiers, um, and they are 500 watt per channel amplifiers. Um, so every speaker in there has at least 1,000 watts driving it, um, even the little two foot high P20s. Um, now what that does, of course, is it ensures that we can really give a dynamic presentation, regardless of the size of the speakers. The level of dynamism yeah. just increases <laughs> until you get to the L150s, which are, uh, well, in two parts, um, both parts six foot tall. They're a big speaker. Yeah, they definitely are. And what's providing the, the images in that room? Um, in that room, again, we're using a, a projector from Digital Projection. Um, that's a model called the Highlight 260. So again, a three-chip DLP projector, um, but it's based on the new 0.65-inch um, DLP chips, which, while still not being a, a budget projector, it's a completely different price point from something like the Titan, or, or to be honest, any traditional three-chip DLP projector. It's, it's a much better price point than we were able to achieve before.
And, and there was a drop-down screen that goes with it? Yeah, and there we've got a, a DNP Supernova Flex screen. Um, so as you saw, that one drops down. It doesn't have that black header. Now, the projector gives us about 2,000 lumens. So 2,000 lumens onto that, that beautiful high-contrast screen. It really gives an image, even with the lights on next door, mm -hmm. a really bright, punchy image, like a TV. Yeah. And that's what we wanted to achieve, to show people Look, you can achieve that big screen format, your 85 inch plasma, let's say, um, but in a system that can disappear up into the ceiling so you don't need to see it the whole time. So it really is des designed around the concept of that being someone's living space. That, that's really what we wanted to, to try and achieve, to show people that they could get a really high level, a really high level audio and video, but in a way that integrates into a normal room not into just a dedicated cinema like we're in here. Although, if I had my way, this would be my front room. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Sod compromise. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> One of the points we raise quite often on the forums, Neil, is that you can have the best equipment in the world, but the room itself can be such a major determinant on its performance. Now, perhaps you could explain the philosophy behind uh, the Wisdom Room, for example. Yeah, it's very easy when we're talking about these high-end facilities. We could have just taken the easy route and put acoustical treatment everywhere and had it all absolutely perfect. But of course that's that's just not reality. Even at the very most expensive systems, that's not reality. People don't want that um, too often in their front room. Um, so what we've done is we've been very, very rigorous in following the standards for speaker placement, um, for subwoofer placement, um, so that we've optimised the, the coupling to the room. But what we also have in both spaces is we do have DSP running in both spaces um, and what that enabled us to do was to do an, a very detailed calibration which enables us to, uh, to you know, to, to correct for some of those anomalies that you get. Now, I hope that, that you've been able to experience that we are able to deliver a very high level of sound performance regardless of the type of room. It's a different type of sound, of course, but it should still be enjoyable and there's really no way why people shouldn't be able to achieve that in their own home. Even the most basic AV receivers now have Odyssey, etc., that enable you to do a decent calibration. You mentioned audio calibration. Um, presumably you also did a video calibration with the projectors in these two rooms. Um, and that's another way, I presume, that people can, uh, can get better performance out of their existing that's system. That's it, exactly. Um, I've yet to see the projector at any price that wasn't made to look better by getting a full calibration. And it's the same with audio. There's no audio system that isn't made better through, through following a lot of the great guidelines that are out there on how to position your speakers and, and how to understand measurements of the room. Um, and that goes for the video system as well. If you understand the measurements that you can make, you can always find improvements that you can do. And we spoke about this last night. That used to be an extremely expensive <laughs> pastime for people like you and I. Um, but of course the tools now that are available um, to forum members for, for very little money uh, really enable them to do a job that even two, three years ago would never have been possible without a big investment. So even more calibration becomes important than it ever was before. Obviously in, in this room, which is a dedicated home cinema, you know, there, there's dark walls, dark floors, dark ceiling in order to, uh, you know, to uh, improve the uh, image performance. But in the other room, you know, it's basically white walls and a wooden floor. So what approach did you take there in order to optimise picture performance? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the challenges. Again, we talked about design and how we could integrate that into a real room. Um, in this room here, the, in the main cinema, we have a white screen. It's just a plain white screen that the projector fires onto. Um, but in the room next door, the Wisdom Audio room, we've used a high contrast screen. Um, that seems to be becoming a more common solution that we're seeing now. Um, the model that we have is the DNP Supernova Flex. Now, what that does is that rejects off-axis ambient light. It's an optical screen surface, so a very, very complicated engineered screen surface. Um, we've coupled that in that room with a, a powerful projector, because typically the, the trade-off with a high contrast screen is that you lose a little bit of the pop in the, in the white colours. Um, and again, I think you've seen that that combination of a high power projector and a high contrast screen gives a really fantastic image, re regardless of the fact that we've got white walls everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Even with the, with the blinds open, you can still see the image quite clearly, which is unusual with a projector. Sure, sure. And I, I, I see more and more that people like the idea of projectors. I think projectors are becoming more and more common. 
in the marketplace. And it is that, that final challenge of how do you integrate that into a real system. And I think more and more in a modern living space it would be cool to be able to hide away the TV when it's not in use. And I really do think that that's a solution that a lot more people might be interested in having. Yeah, because looking at the drop-down screen in the in the wisdom room, it's actually on little wires, isn't it? Which you can barely see, which gives the effect of it almost being a panel hanging in space. I, I, absolutely. When that one drops down, it, it is pure theatre. It's it's for me clearly the best, best in the market. place. Of course, you pay for that, um, but there are there are other solutions now. Um, DNP themselves have a model that's not quite so highly engineered, um, but is a completely different price point, which lets you get that same effect um, in the home environment. The, the other thing as well, of course, is in the main cinema here we have an extremely large screen. We have a four metre screen in here and most people, to be honest, can't fit that into their own home environment. Um, the advantage that you have, though, is with a slightly smaller screen, you're getting more, more light reflected back from your projector over a smaller area. So you get that extra pop as well. So coming back to where we were as well with the standards, people can put all of that together, standards, screen size, screen materials, to, to get something that can perform to a very, very high level in their own home without necessarily having, you know, your old back cave cinema. Yeah. I notice, it, obviously, in, in this dedicated home cinema, you have a, a full 2.35 to 1 screen with side masking. But I, I notice that, interestingly, you're not using an anamorphic lens for this. Um, explain how you, have you approached it here. Um, the, there's actually two things that we do in this room. Um, when we're looking for uh, an easy setup, and even in a room like this, everyone likes an easy setup, what we're actually doing is we're using a video processor. Um, in this space, we're using a Lumagen video processor to electronically switch between 16 by 9 and 2.35. Um, but what we also have the capability of in this room is the projector has an intelligent lens system, um, which used to be an incredibly uncommon feature but more and more you're seeing that on, on flagship models from companies like JVC. Um, now what that does is it stores zoom, shift and focus for the lens. We have nine presets in this room. So we are able to, to, to physically change the size or optically change the size of the image that's projected onto the screen without using an anamorphic lens. Um, there are always pluses and minuses to every method. Um, but we feel that that's an approach that works very, very well. And certainly we've not had any complaints from people in this room. Well, I, I, I saw some stuff on it recently and I have to say it was quite impressive, yeah. Um, and particularly with scope images. That big widescreen image filling your field of view, there's nothing quite like it. Yeah, when, uh, when we designed this room it was quite nerve-wracking <laughs> to see the size <laughs> of the screen that we have in here. Um, but I, I also am very happy with it. We, uh, we always just leave it now as big as it can possibly go. <laughs> And people seem to be... When it comes to home cinema, size does matter. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, also, quick mention to these very comfortable seats that we're currently sat in, because um, they actually go back and you can... Yep. Like lazy boys, basically. Yeah, we have, we have five. These are Cinematech incliners, these chairs. Um, so they're pretty clever. Uh, the backs here, because they're an incliner, they don't fold backwards. What happens is the seat slides down. A bit like an aircraft. Yeah, yeah. So class seat. <laughs> um, you can have these ones flat against the wall if you want to, um, without losing the ability to, to put the footrest back and, and incline them. Um, but they are very comfortable. Um, we, we often joke that we have uh, not, not the worst office in the world, but possibly the best office <laughs> in the world. And it's always a fight to stay late at the end of the day and watch some films <laughs> rather than to run away home. I can see the temptation. Well, hopefully you've picked up some interesting uh, tidbits on, on home cinema design. And if you've got any further questions, of course, we'll, we'll get Neil back onto a home cinema podcast um, early next year. Um, so what I can say is um, thank you to Neil. Thank you, Steve. And, and thank you for watching.